Sister Claire Crockett, servant sister of the Home of the Mother, alone with Christ alone. Chapter 7, Don't Look Back It was the morning of June 18th, 2001. In the corridor outside the kitchen, Margaret Crockett was literally down on her hands and knees before her eldest daughter. Claire, please, please do not. Her loud sobs interrupted the desperate supplication. She attempted to take a deep breath as the tears continued to flow. Do not leave us. You are my firstborn. Is this how you repay me for all I have suffered and done for you? Claire calmly responded, Mammy, I am sorry, but I have to. Margaret wailed, If you go out that door, you may as well go out in a box. Shauna, who was crying upstairs, came down and helped her mother stand up. This scene had been going on all morning. Friends and neighbours had been over, all trying to convince Claire to stay. How could she explain her vocation if as soon as she opened her mouth she was surrounded by harsh accusations, hostile laments and bitter tears? Some of her friends decided not to go say goodbye, simply to avoid making the moment any more dramatic. Claire's only consolation was that it was almost over. Would she have been strong enough to undergo this pressure for a month? As Margaret held on to Shauna and got to her feet, she expressed one last petition. I just ask you to pass by and say goodbye to your granny and granddad. Without responding, Claire went upstairs to her room to try to find a moment of quiet. She prayed interiorly, Lord, give me strength. She had already been over to the house of her mother's parents the night before to say goodbye, and this morning her father had taken her over to his parents. She did not know whether she would be able to stand another visit to her grandparents. Half an hour later, she got in the car with her father to go to the airport. We'll drive by your granny's house, right? Her father asked, breaking the silence. Claire nodded. She could now see the house in the distance. Her granddad was out on the porch and there was her granny at the window. Tears started to come to Claire's eyes. Lord, this is so hard. I don't know if I can do it. She felt her strength falter. Daddy, she said firmly, drive on. He looked at her with astonishment, but silently obeyed. Lord, I trust in you, was the prayer that spontaneously came to her lips. After checking in at the airport, they went to a restaurant to get something to eat and drink. Here, Gerard made his last attempt to convince his daughter to stay. Claire, we can still go home together. Are you really sure? She looked into her father's eyes, pained by his inability to understand her decision. Daddy, I have to do this. After they finished, they walked towards the security and customs checkpoint. She said her final goodbye and walked in. After a few moments, she suddenly heard her father crying her name. Claire, Claire, Claire. His voice cut through her like a knife. It got louder and more insistent with every cry until his voice cracked and he could no longer continue. It was his last opportunity to try to convince her to stay. Claire knew with a certainty that could only come from God that she could not look back. She continued forward towards the gate. In the midst of all her anguish, she clearly felt our Lord consoling her, explaining to her that he would be her mother, her father, her language, her country. She had to trust and to continue to walk forward without looking back. Father Raphael and two candidates went to pick Claire up from the airport when she arrived on the evening of Monday, June 18th, 2001. Once in Zorita, all the sisters came out to receive her with a very warm welcome, making her immediately feel at home. She was able to share a little with the sisters and with Father about the trials of the past few days, and they all encouraged her to trust in the Lord and to give thanks that he had given her the strength to remain faithful to his call. Father asked her if she would like to enter as a candidate of the Servant Sisters on August 11th, the Feast of St. Clair of Assisi, and she loved the idea. This would be the moment when she would officially begin to form part of the community of Servant Sisters. It would be the first step in the long process of discernment. Her two years as a candidate would be followed by two years of novitiate, five years of temporal vows, and then lastly, her perpetual vows, if both she and the community discerned that God was truly calling her. Claire then went to the Casita, a little house next door to the sisters' new novitiate, where she would live with the candidates. In that moment, there were a total of seven candidates, four of whom would enter the novitiate that July. 
I myself would arrive the following day together with three other girls from the States. The house of the new novitiate was under construction at the time. In the mornings, we would walk five minutes towards the professed sister's house to have time for prayer before the Blessed Sacrament exposed. We would then return and spend the day helping the sisters at the new novitiate to paint and to strengthen the old stone walls with new cement. There were moments when Claire was enthusiastic about helping out and other moments when she was not so thrilled. Sister Karen McMahon, an Irish novice at the time, walked into the casita one day and saw Claire there, smoking, with her feet up on the table while the rest of the girls were working. She playfully scolded Claire. Long live Ireland! Look at our representation from Ireland! Claire took it calmly and responded as she took her feet off the table. I, I am on my way. In the afternoon, the English speakers would have Spanish class. We started with very basic vocabulary and the present tense of the verbs. It was fun to study with Claire, who constantly made jokes and laughed at the new Spanish words. There was something about the word gusano, worm, and ayo, garlic, that she found particularly amusing. She would constantly say her favourite Spanish words, even when they made no sense in the context. Later, as a candidate, when the novelty of the classes and her initial enthusiasm had disappeared, her jokes, often directly aimed at boycotting the class or study times, could make it difficult to concentrate and learn at times. I even remember her escaping from the study room to go for a walk with another one of the candidates. In the evening, there was always a formation meeting with Father Raphael. He would start with a quote from a book he was reading at the time or with a spontaneous question and then start a discussion from there. Everyone could participate as the purpose was to help us learn to think and reflect and Father Raphael would guide the conversation. The topics could vary from the evangelical councils of poverty, chastity and obedience, to the spiritual life and prayer, the virtues, etc. Claire enjoyed these meetings and always participated. Right after the meeting, we would have the sacrifice of the Mass and then we girls would return to the casita, or the wee house, as Claire would say, for supper. In the first few days, Claire finished all the cigarettes she had on her. She knew that once she entered in August, she would have to stop smoking definitely. Just five days after arriving, We went on a pilgrimage to Lourdes. Since the second year novices were going to take their first vows on July 2nd, Father Raphael had decided to take them to Lourdes as part of the preparation for their surrender to the Lord. There were some free seats in the cars and a group of us girls got to join them. We had to get up early since Lourdes was a five-hour drive away and it was just a one-day trip. After two hours or so, we stopped at a gas station to have breakfast. The sisters started taking out the plastic cups, bread, milk and coffee. Instead of buying meals on the way, the sisters had packed everything, like always. It was much cheaper that way. When we finished breakfast, we started cleaning up, but Claire was nowhere to be found. All of a sudden, we spotted her talking with a man who had just parked. The man had a pack of cigarettes in his hand, and yes, Claire was making gestures to try to ask him for a cigarette. Seeing him smoke, the temptation had become too great for her to resist. I went running over to the man with a few other girls and tried to forbid him, in English, to give her a cigarette. The man, quite amused by the group of scandalised Americans, gave her the cigarette while we screamed, No! Claire ignored us and asked him to light it with his lighter. Not showing the least trace of remorse, she smiled at us as she placed the cigarette between her lips and began to smoke. I cannot help but imagine that she enjoyed the drama of the moment more than the cigarette itself. Our Lord was to be very patient with her in these first months. Leaving behind her cigarettes and doing physical work, however, were the least of the trials she faced in those first few weeks. Our Lord had a new and painful hardship waiting for her to test her and to ask her to renew her yes and her decision to follow him. After the day in Lourdes, she joined the other girls and candidates in the intense preparations for the summer camp that would take place from July 3rd to 13th. It would be her first summer camp with Home of the Mother. We went down to Priego, Cuenca, for the ceremony of the sisters' vows on July 2nd. The day after the camp began, she received an unsettling phone call. Her grandfather, James Doyle, had suddenly passed away. She had not stopped to say her last goodbye to him before going to the airport. Did he die in a state of grace? How was her granny taking it? And her mother? These ideas tormented her as she headed back to the airport for his funeral. Claire arrived in Ireland to accompany her family and pray for her grandfather. It was a very difficult and painful moment for the family, as they were all very close. Her granny was the one who was suffering the most. 
her health seemed to be quickly waning. Claire spent those days at her granny's house to attend to her needs and keep her company. Her family came up with plans and schemes to hold Claire back. From what we can gather, Claire attempted to defend her vocation and her new way of life by dramatically exaggerating her piety and even inventing stories about what life was like among the sisters. We should keep in mind that Claire had not yet reached maturity in the spiritual life and her desire to be faithful was mixed with an immature enjoyment of being the centre of attention and shocking her friends and family with her exaggerated attitudes and stories. Despite all of this, after a day or so, her family was convinced that she would never return to Spain. Aside from all the reasons they had previously used to try to convince Claire to stay home, this time there were a few more. They were sure they had her this time. We need you, Claire, to take care of Granny, her family insisted. Granny needs you. After you left, Grandad died of a broken heart. Are you going to kill Granny too? Claire started to have doubts. Feelings of guilt weighed down upon her. How could she abandon her grandmother? Would that not be a sin against charity? Ignatius of Loyola says that the devil often presents himself as an angel of light. This is precisely what he did on this occasion. She slowly began to be convinced that she had to stay to take care of her grandmother. Claire phoned Spain and asked to speak to Sister Elena. She told her all that had been happening, how much she owed her grandmother and how much her grandmother needed her. So I won't be coming back to Spain, Claire concluded. Sister Elena immediately suspected the devil could be taking advantage of the situation to tempt Claire and tried to help her to be conscious of what this decision could mean in the long run. If she did not return now, would she have the strength to do so in a few months, knowing that her family would continue to pressure her? She knew well that her family would not happily allow her to return in a few months or even a few years. Unfortunately, many have rejected or abandoned the call of the Lord precisely because they have given in to pressures coming from family and friends. Our Lord says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. These are hard words, but they are Jesus's words. It is clear that the verb hate must not be interpreted as the sin of hatred. What Jesus is underlining is that not even family ties should impede discipleship. We must love him more. Again, when a young man asked the Lord if he could follow him after burying his father, that is, after taking care of his father until death, Jesus responded, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yes, responding to the Lord's call can imply leaving behind loved ones to follow him. This love is then elevated to a supernatural level, even though they may not recognise it at first. A religious vocation is always an immense blessing for all our family members. True love for our families, in fact, demands faithfulness to our vocation. The salvation of our family members, which is their true good, may partly depend on our surrender to the Lord and our prayers for them. In Claire's case, it was clear that the main intent for her family was not the health of the grandmother, but keeping Claire home, that is, impeding discipleship. Other family members, such as her grandmother's own children, had the first responsibility to take care of her. They lived near and could do so with great affection. St. Paul says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, and the vocation is this great treasure that must be protected. Sister Elena helped Claire to see this. After this conversation, Claire decided she would respond to his call. She knew she had to trust that he would take care of her grandmother and of the rest of the family. This knowledge, however, did not make what she was about to do any easier. Claire felt that she did not have the strength necessary to tell her grandmother she was leaving or to explain why. She knew she had to leave, but she was so torn interiorly that she was afraid she would break down and give in if her grandmother insisted she stay. Claire called a taxi to come and pick her up at her grandmother's house the following morning to go to the airport. That evening, her granny began to talk about the following day's plans. We can go out and buy bread and then... Claire just nodded. At the established time the following morning, she grabbed her bag and silently tiptoed to the door, taking care to open it silently. There was the taxi waiting. Perhaps because of her nervousness, she closed the door of the house loudly, waking up her grandmother, who sh started shouting her name. Claire, Claire, where are you going? That was exactly what Claire had wanted to avoid. She felt broken inside, but she knew what she had to do. Without looking back, she walked towards the taxi, got in and shut the door. 
When the sisters picked her up at the airport in Spain, Claire was waiting outside with a sombre visage and a cigarette in her mouth. It was obvious that she was suffering. Our Lord had given her just enough strength of will to return, but it had not been easy. The interior battle was still intense. Now back with the sisters and girls in the casita, the Lord consoled her and healed her interiorly. She had chosen him above all other things, and he rewarded her generosity. Time flew by, and it was soon August 11th, Feast of St. Clair of Assisi, the day set for Clare's entrance as a candidate. She entered during Mass at 10 in the morning in Barcelona, Cantabria. Mother Anna, the General Superior of the Servant Sisters, asked Clare, Dear sister, what do you ask of us? Clare responded, that you permit me to experience for a period of time what your consecrated life consists of and that you assess my attitude with a view to following Christ in the servant sisters of the home of the mother of all humanity, mother of the youth. She then affirmed that she wished to live in poverty, chastity and obedience and to live in communion and in community with the servant sisters. All responded Amen and Claire knelt down to read the entrance formula. Lord Jesus Christ, I have heard your voice say to me, follow me. The one who wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I commit myself to follow you as a servant sister of the home of the mother of all humanity, mother of the youth, and I offer myself to fulfil the work that is your gift to your mother and our mother. Mother Anna entrusted the new candidate to Sister Rocio Galmez, who would be her former during these first moments as she learned the life of a candidate of the Servant Sisters. Father Raphael then concluded with a prayer and blessing. It was a day of gladness and celebration. Claire had finally given herself to God. Her radiant smile expressed her interior joy. From this day onward, she was to wear a long skirt as a sign of her consecration. In a little notebook, on the first pages of which Claire had written the Home of the Mother, morning consecration prayers, she wrote the following prayer on the last page. It is a clear expression of the desires that were nearest to her heart around this time, when she had just left her country, her family, her friends, and all that was dear to her heart, so as to follow God. Dear Lord, please watch over everyone in my family and everyone who has been good, generous, and kind to me. I pray especially for the Gallaghers, who have been exceptional people and who need my prayers. For my mother, father and two sisters who have not yet really found you, I pray that you touch their hearts immensely. I pray for all the people of the world who put other things before you and have no respect for you. I pray for the people who have hurt me and whom I have hurt. I pray for priests and that there may be more vocations to the religious life. I pray for those who have died. May they rest in peace. I pray for all those who are poor, sick and lonely especially old people. I pray especially for the home of the mother, the servant sisters and brothers and fathers who have made me so happy. I pray for myself that I may lead a good life and become a faithful servant sister who does nothing but think about you. I love my Lord, my God, my true friend and father. I love you, Mary. Pray for me and watch over me. Also, ask Mammy to pray for me. Thank you for everything.